Okay, so welcome to this uh, next video in which we are discussing uh, the drug treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so we're in the process of discussing the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. So we've discussed that when you get the formation of this inflammatory exudate in the interstitial fluid of the synovial membrane, uh, what's going to happen is that you're going to bring in uh, the components of the calocrine kinin system, uh, which is going to uh, trigger the production of bradykinin and calidin, which will then cause, uh, firstly, uh, a positive feedback loop where they activate uh, endothelial cells in the type 1 fashion, uh, just like histamine, and also it's going to activate receptors on uh, sensory uh, neurons, specifically pain sensory neurons, which will trigger uh, pain in the affected joint and loss of function of that joint. Okay, right. Uh, so, what we want to now discuss is another component of the inflammatory exudate, uh, which is the coagulation cascade. Okay, so when you uh, bring in all of the coagulation factors from the blood into the interstitial fluid of the, um, of the um, synovial membrane, what's going to happen is you're going to set off the coagulation cascades. Okay, now let me just describe to you the coagulation cascades. So, coagulation, as we've discussed before, is the process where you convert fibrinogen, this inert uh, protein within the blood, into fibrin. And then the fibrin is then assembled into fibrin strands. And these fibrin strands will then form a meshwork. And the idea, the reason you'd want this occurring in an inflammatory exudate is because, remember, this entire response is initiated uh, because we think we have detected some highly dangerous pathogen within um, the interstitial fluid of the synovium, okay? Uh, and the reason you'd want this fibrin meshwork being formed at the site where you think you've got an incredibly dangerous pathogen is that uh, it will form like a very dense spider's web which will hopefully trap uh, the pathogen in and stop it from spreading because the nightmare scenario is that the pathogen will spread to the blood and cause septicemia, okay? Um, so the fibrin meshwork is there to try and prevent the pathogen from spreading. Okay, so let me describe to you then the coagulation cascades. So there are two coagulation cascades. Firstly, let's discuss the intrinsic coagulation cascade. And this is triggered by the same thing as uh, the calocrine kinin system is triggered by. Okay, so it's triggered by Hageman factor or factor 12 coming out of the uh, bloodstream and binding to collagen and becoming factor 12A. Okay, or activated Hageman factor. Now, we saw that one of the things that activated Hageman factor can do is that it can activate pre or Fletcher factor to activated Fletcher factor, also called calocrine, and that triggers the calocrine kinin system. Okay, but another thing that it can do once it's been activated is that it can act on another coagulation factor which will have come out of the blood. Okay, so all of the, well, nearly all of the coagulation factors are produced by the liver and are present in the blood in their inert forms. So 11, factor 11 will come out of the blood into the interstitial fluid. It will be activated by the factor 12A into factor 11A. Okay. Factor 11A then activates another coagulation factor, which is factor 9, another inert um, protein within the blood, okay, and it will then be converted to 9A. Now, 9A uh, requires a cofactor in order for it to work, so let me just explain what a cofactor is. So basically, you have activated 9A, okay, and now, in order to form an active enzyme, all it needs is one final little protein to come and bind to a little socket here. And this protein that it needs to come and bind to the main bulk of the enzyme is known as the cofactor for that enzyme. Okay, and the cofactor for factor 9A is factor 8A. Okay, so 8A. So 8A is a small little protein which will bind to the back of 9A and then they'll form a complex which will then uh, catalyze uh, the conversion of factor 10 okay, into factor 10A.
Okay, right. So, you might be wondering, well, where does the 8a come from? But I'll come to that in a moment. Okay, so 10a, again, has a cofactor. So, it requires further activation. It requires another protein to bind to it before it will be an active enzyme. And the cofactor for factor 10a is factor 5a. Okay, so factor 10a and factor 5a bind together to make an active enzyme, which will then convert, and I'll have it going this way this time, Factor 2, which is again so important uh, that it has another name. Its other name is prothrombin. And it will convert factor 2, or prothrombin, into factor 2a, which again has another name, which is thrombin. Okay, so this is the overall result of the intrinsic coagulation cascade that you activate thrombin. Thrombin is going to take it from here, basically. Okay, uh, it's now going to convert factor 1, which remember is also called fibrinogen, into factor 1a, which is fibrin. Okay, uh, so this factor 1 up here, this is also called fibrinogen. Okay, and factor 1a is also called fibrin. Now, fibrin is a little protein. In order for it to actually assemble into great big uh, polymers, you need to assemble it into fibrin strands, and the enzyme which is going to do that assembly is an enzyme known as factor 13A. Okay, uh, so 13A is going to assemble the fibrin monomers into fibrin polymers, which are called fibrin strands. And let me just straighten this page up a little bit. Okay, and then you'll get the fibrin strands all joining together to form a fibrin meshwork, uh, which will, uh, in the case of a normal acute inflammatory response, contain the pathogen. In the case of this uh, synovitis, you're going to get fibrin deposited everywhere in the uh, intima and also in the subintima, but mainly in the intima. The intima almost gets replaced by a fibrin meshwork, basically, which is known as the fibrin cap. Okay, now, you may ask, where does factor 13A come from? Well, it comes from factor 13, which is circulating within the blood, inactive. So what activates it to 13A? Well, it's thrombin that converts 13 to 13A. So thrombin does these two essential things, which is that it converts 1 to 1A and 13 to 13A and 13A then acts on the 1A that thrombin's already made and assembles it into fibrin strands. Okay, now, I promised to tell you where the two cofactors, 8A and 5A, came from. Well, basically, thrombin is responsible for the production of 8A and 5A, which seems counterintuitive. It seems very contradictory, basically, because uh, in order to get the activation of thrombin, you needed 8A and 5A to already exist. And the reality is that some 8A and some 5A will always exist, basically, even if you don't have thrombin active. Okay, so you always get a little bit of this pathway going on if you activate factor 12, basically. Okay, and then what you should see it as is a positive feedback loop where once you've activated a bit of thrombin, it will then create much more 5A and 8A. And then you'll get a huge amplification of the result, uh, well, of this pathway, basically, and therefore uh, amplification of how much thrombin is activated, so it will continue in this positive feedback loop like so. Okay, right, so that's the intrinsic coagulation cascade, and fundamentally it's activated by collagen. It's activated by factor 12 coming into contact with collagen. Okay, so remember it is collagen which activates Hageman factor or factor 12. Okay, so the intrinsic coagulation cascade is activated when the coagulation factors come out of the bloodstream and into the interstitial fluid where collagen is present. Okay, the extrinsic coagulation cascade is activated by a different protein than collagen. Okay, so now let's discuss the extrinsic cascade. Okay, so basically, um, there is a protein that is on the surface of cells in the peripheral uh, tissue fluid, basically. And this protein is known as tissue factor. Now, this is a protein that the coagulation factors are never allowed to see when they're in the blood. Uh, 
okay? So it's not within the blood, and it's not on the apical surface of endothelial cells. So coagulation factors, when they're circulating in the bloodstream, will never see it. And this protein is called tissue factor. Okay, and it's also got another name. So tissue factor is its old name. It's also called coagulation factor three, and it's unusual in the coagulation factor for the coagulation factors because it doesn't have this inactive state and this active state. It's just factor three, and basically, it is present and it will activate the next coagulation factor in the extrinsic coagulation cascade all the time. The problem is it never sees the next component of the extrinsic coagulation cascade because the next component is within the bloodstream. Okay, so the next component is factor 7, which it's going to convert into factor 7a. However, factor 7 is usually circulating within the bloodstream. However, when you get uh, the formation of an inflammatory exudate because of synovitis, okay, what's going to happen is that factor 7 is going to come into the interstitial fluid out of the bloodstream, and then it's going to be acted upon by this factor 3, this tissue factor, which will convert it into 7A. And then what's going to happen is that 7A is going to act on factor 10, okay, which has also come out of the blood and in, is now in the interstitial fluid and it's going to convert it to factor 10A. Factor 10A will then associate with its cofactor again, 5A. Okay, so here's 5A. And together, that uh, 5A, 10A complex uh, will then uh, convert uh, prothrombin, or factor 2, into factor 2A, or thrombin. And then the factor 2A uh, will act on the fibrinogen, or factor 1, and convert it into 1A, or fibrin, and then of course, at factor 13 will be activated by factor at 2A, uh, or prof oh, sorry, or thrombin, and then once you've got the factor 13A, factor 13A will then act on the uh, fibrin and assemble it into fibrin strands. Okay, so you're going to get fibrin strands being produced. Okay, so both of these uh, coagulation cascades are going to lead to fibrinogen being converted in, from fibrinogen into fibrin and then into fibrin strands. Okay, so you're going to get fibrin strands being deposited uh, in the uh, intima of the synovial membrane and also in the subintima of the synovial membrane. And this is going to form what's known as a fibrous cap uh, that uh, basically almost replaces the uh, intima of the synovium. Okay, so that's another one of these uh, features of synovitis, that you're going to get the generation of this fibrin cap, basically. Now, what we now want to discuss is how, once you've got this synovitis occurring in the uh, synovial joint, what can then happen is you can initiate more adaptive immune responses uh, against uh, proteins that are within the uh, synovial joint, and um, specifically within the synovial membrane of the synovial joint. So there are all sorts of proteins that are citrullinated uh, in the synovium. Okay, so remember initially we imagined that we had initiated um, an adaptive immune response against citrullinated protein 4, but there could be a citrullinated protein 5, a citrullinated protein 6, a citrullinated protein 7, and suddenly these are now all exposed to uh, the immune system, and potentially we can now start initiating adaptive immune responses against those. Okay, so previously maybe the adaptive immune system couldn't see them, even though it had lost tolerance to them, it just couldn't see them, so it hadn't initiated an adaptive immune response to them, even though because of the loss of tolerance it could have initiated an adaptive immune response against them. So what's going to happen in the years that the synovitis continues is you're going to produce potentially more adaptive immune responses against uh, citrullinated proteins uh, of the synovium. And I want to emphasize that obviously you shouldn't be initiating these adaptive immune responses against these citrullinated proteins in the synovium. They are self-proteins. They should not have this initiated against them. But you have lost tolerance, so you will do. Okay, and uh, these 
Adaptive immune responses are firstly going to lead to more antibody being produced, which will then uh, go in and obviously propagate, perpetuate uh, the uh, chronic inflammatory response. And they're also going to lead to uh, bone degradation, basically, the degradation of the two bones involved in the synovial joint where this uh, rheumatoid arthritis is occurring. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion uh, where we'll discuss the adaptive immune response in more detail in the uh, next video.